Hello everyone and welcome to the BFI Film Academy September Lab. My name is Fiona and I'm the BFI Film Academy Event Coordinator. In today's session we'll be teaching you everything you need to know about shooting a film in 2021. This session will be hosted by the BFI's Race Equality Lead, Rico Johnson Sinclair. Just before I hand over to Rico, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how today's session will work. My colleagues are here, we'll be managing our chat box. If you want to say hi or introduce yourself um, or ask any generic BFI or BFI Film Academy questions, pop them in the chat and Zakia can answer them for you. Just remember to select everyone in the um, chat uh, option just to make sure, because I think it defaults to panelists only, um, make sure it's said to everyone and then all attendees will be able to see what you write. If you do decide to use the chat box, please be respectful, be respectful to our guests and to each other. Don't use any offensive language and, and don't share any personal details about yourself. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, we have circulated an online events code of conduct in the email that had the Zoom details in it. So if you need to refresh your memory about that code of conduct, please check that out. Um, make sure to join our Facebook networking group. Um, it's a great place to meet each other and find potential collaborators. Uh, Zakia will pop that link in the chat box shortly. Um, just a reminder, any questions for our guests or, or the host, please put them in the Q&A box. So at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A option. So that's where your, um, your Q&As for the panelists need to go. We'll be allowing 15 minutes at the end of the session uh, to get through as many of these questions as we can. So be brave, ask your questions. Um, so, and just finally, uh, today's session will be recorded. Uh, so um, we'll be posting that recording to the BFI YouTube channel later this week. Uh, so keep an eye out on that one. That's all from me. I'll uh, pass over to Rico. Enjoy the session. Hey everyone, I'm Rico Johnson Sinclair and welcome to The Future Is Now, uh, where we're going to talk about uh, filmmakers' utopia and how to get there and how that starts right now. So without further ado, let's start. I'm Rico Johnson Sinclair. Um, I'm the race equality lead for the BFI. I am a black male with short curly hair um, and sitting in a room full of plants with white walls. Um, and I've got a little bit of a beard too and a black and white t-shirt. So I'm gonna pass over to Joshua. Hello everybody. My name is Joshua Okpala. I'm an actor and intimacy coordinator. And a quick brief overview, I nurture and facilitate the creation of intimate scenes whilst maintaining consent and boundaries. I've worked with Netflix, BBC, Amazon, Channel 4, and my pronouns are he, him. I'm wearing a beige polo t-shirt. I have mid-length black hair in plaits, and I'm in a white room with a blue painting behind me. Let's go for Jay next. Jane, who's having difficulty unmuting her Zoom. I'm Jane Doolan. Uh, I'm a cisgender female. I'm 55. Uh, I have gray hair. Um, I use pronouns she, her. I'm a producer. Um, I'm sitting in a relatively white room as well. It is a room, I think. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm wearing a Kind of beige jumper as well with a, a stripe with an orange stripe in it, depending on if I move close to the camera or back from the camera. So that's me. Perfect, Jane. And tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Um, I'm a producer for over 30 years. Uh, curiously, I've never produced a short film, so I'm an anomaly in this. Uh, but I have been involved in 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 short films very much over the years. I started my life in commercials over 30 years ago, um, which are like short films. And uh, I have been a producer of feature films. Um, uh, recently, Wolf uh, is, is probably the most recent feature film, but in the last number of years, I've done quite a number of features and I was a distributor for many years. So I'm someone who's actually skipped around within the film industry. I've been a producer, a distributor, um, and uh, that's that's pretty much yeah. 
where where I am at the moment. Perfect, Jane. Thank you. And finally, Michelle. Thank you so much, Rico. Hello, everybody. My name is Michelle White. Um, I'm an applied positive psychologist. So um, positive psychology means I work in the fields of things like strengths and values, leadership, resilience, growth mindset, solution focused thinking, um, optimal performance, resilience. Um, and I do a lot of this work within the film and TV industry. My background is in the film and TV industry. Um, before I retrained as a psychologist, I worked at the BFI, um, like Rico, for many, many years. Um, I work for an organization uh, called Six Foot from the Spotlight. Um, so we do a lot of training and advocacy work around mental health and general well-being within the film and TV sector. Um, so I am a, a white cisgender woman. Uh, I have long, dark blonde hair. I'm wearing um, a black um, shirt with um, colorful flowers on. Um, I'm in a, a white room and I have white shutters behind me. Perfect. Thank you, Michelle. So, Let's get on to the why. So we're here to talk to you today about the various different things you'll need to build into your practice to be able to develop a more inclusive film industry. But I guess before we talk about that, we should talk about the why. Why is this important? Like, why, why is this essential to your filmmaking journey? Why is it essential to you as young filmmakers? Um, so what do we all think? I'm happy for whoever wants to go first. Maybe I will. <laughs> Um, why inclusive filmmaking is essential and why now it always has been, I think, is really the fact. And um, I was trying to think back of ways to, I, I'm, I'm not used to doing many of these panels, and I was trying to think of what might be an, a, a good way to introduce myself and, and where I'm coming from and where I have come from over 30 years to a young uh audience out there no wherever you are I can't see you um and I think I, I I thought back to how I ended up in in filmmaking as a as a woman over 30 years ago and it was uh seeing as being as in when I was a child I I I was a bit of a television addict I was constantly in front of telly and and I was lucky in that it had just television had just started um and Biddy Baxter's name used to come up at the end of Blue Peter. And I was always seen men represented and very few women. And this name caught my imagination. And I kid you not, like it was only whatever, nine, 10, this name, Biddy Baxter, apart from the fact that it's a pretty cool name, Biddy Baxter. Um, I became upset and it always stayed with me that I thought I can do this. Um, it's a very tiny kernel. Of something but I was just trying to think of of something if you're young what what are the triggers that maybe make us feel we can do um and and so I'm drifting which I tend to do a bit so you, Rico please you know if I do just shut me down straight away Definitely um <laughs> but uh it's it's just for me I think it's that awareness you know it's always been we should be inclusive we haven't been and I think we're beginning to be more aware now um, and, and for me, that's that's kind of critical because filmmaking for me is about curiosity, openness. And so definitely that is is a very important, you know, uh, factor for me in, in every film. It, you know, it, it can be hierarchical on a set, as we all know, and that can lead to people feeling they're in charge and, and a, a kind of dynamics that are. Can, can intimidate some people. Everyone is important on a set. Every, it's a collaborative art form. And that is really important always to remember. So for me, it's always been about being inclusive, but I think it hasn't been. And I think we're much more aware now and I'm hoping we'll continue that awareness. I definitely resonate with that, Jane. Like, as a you know, a, a black queer person wanting to join the industry, it took me a very long time to go around route to get into the industry. I had to start as a programmer because there wasn't much infrastructure in anywhere other than London, especially in the regions. So I had to do programming, um, and I love programming. It's definitely 
part and parcel of what I want to do. Um, but I learned to love programming, whereas I've always wanted to be a writer, always wanted to make films and definitely had to go quite a far way through programming down this route um, to be able to even like leverage that to get into film. So being a filmmaker that's done two shorts now, I definitely had to push for that. But what when I actually joined the industry, I guess what I found was that there was also a lack of authenticity and a lot of the opportunities I was getting were tokenistic too. So I was I was being um, brought into things because they're like a, a predominantly white director had written a black short and then had no authentic voice on that on that um, on that production. So I was brought in to add that authentic voice to that production, but actually I was brought in about two weeks before production to kind of <laughs> work with them. So I think, yeah, there is, I, I think we, we are at a point now where people are starting to be more consciously aware. And I, part, I think that's definitely part of being part of a digital age where we can have these very large scale conversations over like vast distances and we can start to really dismantle the issues that we have in systems. What do you think, Josh? What, why, why now? Why, why inclusion? <laughs> yeah, literally just going off what you just said, Rico, um, with that authentic, authenticity in the film and the art that we want to produce. And likewise with what you were saying, it's important to have the people that can show that with the diversity that you bring to set. And the only way to, I guess, give a platform or a voice to all of these different stories that everybody has is to include them in the process of the short films on production, pre-production. You need to have them on the earlier stage so they can be part of it and express their own experience to put that through to the art. So hundred percent, the authenticity, the only way to truly get there in my opinion is to open that up to other people to have their voice heard so it can be shown through the art that we create. Yeah, I agree. Um, the um, TV and film charity just released a report to say that, you know, mental health in the industry is a complex thing. Um, and I think that mental health is so important and well-being is so important to being on set. So Michelle, do you want to talk a little bit about um, why you think this is important? Maybe give us a story of when um, when that's, that, that process on set was really beneficial to a production? Yeah, thank you, um, Rico. So, um, uh, you know, the film and TV charity report is, is well worth um, everybody going to have a look at. It is a really, really um, comprehensive report. And like Rico says, it, it really reflects how complex mental health is for us individually. And then, you know, in, within the ecosystem um, of, a, of any organisation, but particularly something like a, a film set where you have many, many different dynamics that you're thinking that you would have to contend with. Um, I, I tend to approach this stuff through the, the, the angle of um, psychological safety on set. And, and I talk a lot about how and why these psychologically safe environments are beneficial. Oh, an overview, psychological safety in and of itself is, is quite complex, but an overview of psychological safety, we would say that these are environments where there are high levels of trust, where there is shared mission and when there is very, very transparent communication. So these would be the three kind of pillars of a psychologically safe environment. But the backbone of psychological safety is absolutely inclusion safety, um, because we, we really, really recognize that you can't have any of these three pillars in place if you don't have inclusion. In terms of the way that the human brain works, inclusion, it's, it's so fundamental to all of us. It's, it's important to the people who are being included as well to see that everybody is being included. Because even if you're in the in group, if you see that people are in an out group, it still creates a lot of uncertainty it destabilizes the entire environment. So it's inclusion safety in terms of our of, of mental health is incredibly important. The other reason that it's really important is that we know from actually decades, decades of research that we've done around this now is that, you know, in psychologically safe environments where everybody is included and everybody feels safe, you are much more likely to get optimal performance. You know, by that I mean they're more creative environments, people are more innovative, they're more strategic, people are much healthier, they're more resilient, they're more productive. I could go on and on about this, but as Jane said, you know, Jane talked about, you know, openness and creativity and how core cool that is in terms of, a, of, a, of an environment to, to, you know, the film 
environment, you can't have openness and creativity if people are scared or fearful or stressed out. These two parts of the brain will not work at the same time. So it's really important, I think, from a mental health perspective that we start to pay a lot of attention to these things and really think a little bit about how the, how the human brain works and to understand that we really have to nurture people if we want to get creativity and we want innovation and we want agility. Um, in terms, um, Rico, you asked me if I had a good example. I mean, I think I've got so many examples. One of the things that our, um, the organization that I work with does is we train well-being facilitators. So um, this is quite similar, Joshua, to the, to the kind of role. It's, a, it's a, probably a kind of like a parallel role to the role that um, Joshua does with his intimacy coordination. So we train people who will go onto a film or a TV set and just take care of every piece of well-being mental health they will do mental health risk assessments they're fully trained in really boring but very important things like mental health and the law because i won't bang on about this stuff rico because i know it's boring for people but it's also it is actually enshrined in law <laughs> as well that we take care of people's well-being um so from the work that i do i, I you know i have i have lots of stories about you know, how we have gone onto film sets that I would say have been really um, struggling and how you can do small things. You know, you can make, we would call them in the industry, kind of reasonable adjustments, little things that you can do. You can go in to completely change somebody's experience of working on a film set. Tiny little tweaks that help to make, you know, one person or indeed a whole group or team of people feel much safer. And then from that, um, you're going to get much more creativity and a healthier, a healthier team. I couldn't agree with that more. And like from my own personal experiences, so <clears throat> I just finished a, a BFI network film last year. Um, and as a person that suffers with bad mental health, I have psychotic symptoms and I was creating a short, terrible idea, but it was a great film um, about racially motivated sexual assault. And it was just so imperative that I had people on set that were dealing with everything else because me as director didn't have the space or the time to come outside of my own experience and also keeping an eye on making sure that the show was going going well, going the way that I wanted it to go to. But also what was really surprising to me, um, and it shouldn't be surprising to me, this should be the way the industry is, but that it was actually um, my funder that pushed for me to have a mental health worker on set, an uh, uh, intimacy coordinator on set. Um, and that was surprising, but also super beneficial because I couldn't have imagined that process without um, those people on set. And also just having a really, uh, really great producer who kind of um, understood um, the, the topic, but didn't really try and hold the topic from me because obviously the complexities of me being a person of color and my producer being white and talking about racially motivated sexual assault that was super important so yeah I, I um like I can I can also give loads of um loads of um insight into times where it was so beneficial and, and so pivotal to the role but also kind of understanding I guess we'll go into this next understanding that you all as, uh, as first time filmmakers, young filmmakers, your budgets will be drastically reduced. So it's really about how you implement those things in a really kind of, um, a really cost effective, uh, but also a really conscious way, a consciously inclusive way. Um, I think we may have lost someone, uh, but I'm gonna move on to the why, sorry, no, the how, we've done the why, the how. So how do our young filmmakers implement things that will benefit their sets how do they with their uh, with, with you know budgets for first-time filmmakers are going to be significantly lower than you know um, experienced filmmakers how do they if they can't afford an intimacy coordinator if they can't afford a mental health practitioner to be on set how do they make sure that they're taking care of the of, of the people on set they're casting their crew how do they make sure they're being care-centered in everything they do i'll throw that out to either of you Well, I, th I think it's really important because, of course, it's it's not always easy to have the budget when you're doing a short film, especially for produce, producing it yourself, to be hiring all of these people. And I completely understand that. But at the same time, it's really getting down to the specificity of the work and whether or not you're having a 
a scene that has stunts or it has intimacy, whatever the scene is, you really try and take all the precautions you can. Um, of course, as an intimacy coordinator, I will say, please try your best to get intimacy coordinator. <laughs> um, there are a lot of people that have trained or finished in training that are open to helping out in any way that they can. I've helped out on short films just because in my head, it's better to have someone than to not have anyone at all. But if you really can't have an intimacy coordinator, then absolutely clue yourself in on what consent is, boundaries, and just having that understanding and empathy so you can speak to the actor and make sure that it's a safe environment for them. Because at the end of the day, we all want it to be a great film and it's a collaborative effort. And like everybody has been saying so far, that when people feel comfortable, then they're a lot more open to the creativity, which is necessary in the short film that you're trying to make. I would definitely, yeah, agree with that. Um, if you can, if you do have the budget, make sure that you're you're paying the people on set to do the jobs that they're trained to do. And I think it's really, really important. And it goes back to equity. Um, like if you are, and especially if you make um, decisions equitably, like if you're doing a film about like black queerness and, and you don't have black queer people on set, then you should be putting money back into the communities that you're trying to speak from. Um, and if, if you're working with people in any situations that are vulnerable, you should be putting money into, into the industries that are there to facilitate that kind of um, activity on your set. So yeah, think about things equitably. Don't just think like, oh, I don't have the money to do it. I don't have the you know capacity to do it. Think about what is right for your film and not just about what will make the film look good, but also about the well-being of everyone that's on set. Michelle, do you have anything to add? And then Jane, we're going to come to you for a story because we missed out on your stories about the why. Um, yeah, what, what would I add to that? Thank you, Joshua. That was um, that was incredible. Um, um, what would I add to that? So I would say I do think that, that sometimes this this stuff can feel really overwhelming, um, particularly if you're a young filmmaker, you're emerging into the industry and then, you, you know, you have all of this other stuff on top as well that, that you now have to think about, um, which, which you really do have to think about. Um, but I would say always focus on what you what you can do. So absolutely, you might be working, you know, with very, very low budgets, but still, you do need to pay attention to what you can do. Um, in terms of if I think about um, creating these psychologically safe environments, um, I would say, you know, pay attention to the voices in the room, who is speaking, you know, how often are they speaking? Do you have very domineering voices there? You know, just really, and it is actually what Jane was, was saying at the beginning, really about just awareness, building up an awareness of, you know, have you got diversity and range of voices that, that you can hear? Um, really sort of paying attention to that. There are really some simple things that you could do, like you could think about behaviors, um, in behaviors and out behaviors. Very, very simple, but it makes it very clear for people. You know, th these, are the, these are the behaviors that are in on our set. These are the behaviors that we absolutely will not stand for. Um, a, kind of aligned to that, you could think about setting up values for the, for the production. So, you know, up front, you know, and this is good because it, it's gonna make sure that you're working with people who are simpatico, synergistic. You're all gonna be on the same page about what you're doing there and what you know aligned with the values which i think is quite important um, um you know you want to think about empowering everybody um again really really important there are very simple things that that you could do you know if you have you know uh, you know team meetings and you're the hod you know as jane said very hierarchical and can be very, very hierarchical in the film and TV industry. Um, you know, are there, are there little things that you could do to break this down a little bit? A very simple thing is to, you can rotate the chair of the meeting. You don't have to have one person who's always chairing a meeting. Is there a really quiet person in your team? Ask them to chair the meeting. You know, it, it's, it's little things that, that you can look at that are gonna help to just empower all of the people um, around you. So I think there's a few, lots of, lots of little things you could do, but there's a few little examples there of, of, of what you, what you can do. And I would always say role model, 
in a, from a leadership perspective, role modeling is the most important thing that you can do. So you've always got to make sure that you are, what's that phrase, you know, w walking the chat, walking the talk. <laughs> um, it's gone a bit late now, my, but that, that you, you're showing, you're actively showing people um, what the behaviors are that you would like to see replicated around you. Yeah, I think that's really important. You spoke about like like small changes. Uh, we're we're habit driven people, and so if we implement those habits really early, well, that almost becomes second like nature. I think the perspective in the industry and with people generally is that this work, inclusive inclusion work, is like aside to filmmaking when actually it's very much involved it's engaged it's almost intrinsically linked and if you're going to join this industry I mean we we may be at a time now where it's started to be introduced but by the time you you as filmmakers start to make your like first big budget um, short film or first feature um, they'll very much be ingrained in so if you're if you're at your early stage of your career now it's probably a great idea to do those small scale changes that will help you just have that thought process engaged so it's not an extra bit of work that you're taking on um and those are simple things like uh like writing a code of conduct before you have meet meetings or a code of conduct for how you want on set uh, how you want people to act on set or make sure you have a bullying and harassment policy that you've written up or gotten from somewhere the bfi has a great one um, make sure you're thinking about anti-racism and equitable practice and make sure that you're con consciously aware of that if you're going into situations and making films about marginalized people so like small scale changes that you can implement into a in, into your set into your production that will help you in the future because this is what what it's all about it's about building towards that better future building towards that utopia jane so the question that i asked before was um if we think about the times where we've been on set and we've seen inclusive practice and how it's benefited the actual film because i think one of the arguments i hear the most from people that talk about inclusion as something separately is that you know it's it's all this extra work and does it actually benefit the film in the end? The the industry is about film. It's about it's about the finished product, the visual um, visual artistic elements. So what can you describe a time where you've seen inclusion in practice on set and it's really benefited that side of film? Um, I'm trying to try. It, first of all, apologies on my internet just completely crashed. And I'm now on my hotspot on fan, and it, it's it's classic the way it, it does it at the wrong time. So I do apologize because I have missed on some of, of these stories. Um the I'm trying to actually I'm trying to actually think. Um and I can't I can't pinpoint, and I know you had it in in in, in the document you sent to us. Um and it's why I started with with the thinking that every set has to be inclusive from the outset. Mm. Um, and I think in a way, if I, I'll back to, I suppose, COVID for us has been a, a, a change in, in filming over the years. One of the things I found, and maybe this, this is, is an answer in a way, is that um, inclusivity was, was threatened in COVID. And it was threatened by virtue of communication, which became quite difficult with masks and with how you had to deal with departments. And having shot a film in, in, in COVID now, I, I realized you had to make such efforts with communication because only a certain amount of number of people were allowed in a room. And you would have to say, can you come up to the production office for a chat, as opposed to having it over the breakfast or something like that. And and it became a big deal when it wasn't, it was, you know. So I, I think things that I learned from it were that you you had to again be aware and think of what this was doing. It made, it, made you have to work harder um, at, at making sure communication was really very clear. And one of the other references you made there about, about uh, code, codes of conduct and which are crucial for, for people to have, but do they all read them in the practical sense of the word? And what I, I, I'm not sure if this happens on, short, on, on, a, on, a, on a short film, but on a feature film, you have your product prep meeting and everybody introduces themselves and you have all your departments. And I think there's two things. Uh, we don't take enough time to introduce ourselves anymore. And I don't know if it's speed or I don't know what it is, but we don't actually have this kind of 
old fashioned. I, my name is Jane. I, and, and I'm the producer and you're and go around the room and there's some people who are quite nervous and they might be very shy, but if we all do it together, it really does help. And I, I, I it's, it's rather probably goes back to a, an old fashioned kind of filmmaking, but I think it's one of the things we should try and hold on to because we don't have enough prep meetings where everybody is together. And that, you know, it's not easy because, you know, props are out in the truck and, you know, but it's just, it's actually really making sure that personally in presence, people feel valued um, and truly valued. Uh, and, and again, I think prep, uh, COVID gave us on the last film I did, because I've done in the last five years, I've done a film a year and you're, you're kind of rushing around and, and, and we were stopped before Wolf because of COVID. And we had an additional two months prep and that prep was invaluable. And on a short film, I mean, you talk about shorts and not having enough financing, but independent filmmaking, whether it's a short or a independent, we all have struggles. You know, where, you know when, when you're not a big studio that can actually just they have a checkbook to, to, to give you resources and it does make it easier. But when we're all there, you're trying to do production, you're actually also doing the schedule, you're down, you're driving people, you're, you're even getting into costume, which I have to, you know, we're doing all of the, we're multitasking. Um, preparation is really invaluable to, you know, if you can't afford the intimacy coach maybe there's workshops maybe you can talk to you know and find out go on things that aren't as expensive but you get you know it's just again being aware that there are things out there for you that you just make sure you interrogate what is it you're trying to do and break down your script and and talk to people and include them from early on and prep is is relatively cheap and particularly if you've no money anyway you might as well just make sure you're well prepped, you know, because if maybe on a short, you've two or three days to, to, sh to shoot it. In fact, I'm actually, the room I'm in at the moment, I know I said I didn't do a short, but a friend just shot a short in, <laughs> in our house. So it's like bits hanging off at the moment. Rule number one, the do not, don't let anyone shoot in your home. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Failed <laughs> a number of times. So... Um, but um, so again, uh, in a rather, in a very specific way, I think COVID taught me that I actually had a way to go in, in had to work very hard at communication. And um, it, it just had put up a barrier, but it made me more aware of how important it is. Um, so I think uh, it, it, it's non-specific, but but important and and you know, so yeah, I, I I definitely agree. I feel like I feel like pre preparing, especially on a short. I mean, my own experience is on a short, so I think preparing on a short is so essential. It's and I think we've now hit this point where because of COVID, we've now had access to you know digital platforms like Zoom, where preparation or communal preparation is actually so much more efficient than you know booking time in an actual space, which costs money. Mm -hmm paying for everyone's travel to a space which costs money for everyone to introduce themselves now it's two hours on a zoom you know a, a mm. couple of people set to do around the room and introduce each other and just get a feel of like the attitudes and, and like michelle said behaviors on set because that is really important as well when you're heading into set so yeah preparation is super invaluable that's a really great one and i think that that feeds into the how as well how you um, implement inclusion especially if you're a first-time filmmaker or a young filmmaker that's going into the industry with a small budget to create a film this is a really easy way that you can implement just some kind of I guess community on your set which really mm. you're trying to kind of leverage like inclusion or, or leverage like good behaviors and working together and, and having those good behaviors I think it's yeah really important so I'm gonna ask you both for uh two do's and two don'ts for inclusion on set and to give you a little bit of time to think I'm going to go first. I don't know if I'm going to regret this. I'm definitely going to regret this. Okay. So do um, 
talk to the people that you hire as crew and cast about your values and inclusion before you hire them i i personally advocate for this because i in both of the films i i did um coming from the background that i come from doing the work that i i do i was make i was making sure that i was having those conversations with anyone or saying like do you value inclusion do you understand the importance of you know equity like what's your understanding of that um, i was having those conversations from the offset and i wasn't necessarily saying no to anyone that didn't understand what i was talking about but i was having the conversations and then if they understood the value of what I, what i was saying then i was able to implement the fact that this was in, of importance to me at the very beginning um I would also say do um, do give yourself and part of part of your contingency budget, especially, uh, should be around inclusion, and well-being. Um, so ring fence a little bit of that money because you never know what's going to happen. And I think that work, good work, can't happen without that being at the core of what you do. Um, it, the good work can't happen unless you're consciously thinking about the well-being of the people on set. Um, instead of going to my don'ts, I'm going to go around and do do, so it gives me a little bit of time to think. So I'm going to go down the screen. So Josh, you're up next. <laughs> Thank you, Rico. <laughs> um, I would say, do you go into, into the situation with the awareness of other bodies in the space, in the sense of everybody says, um, speak to people as you would like to be spoken to, but at the same time having the awareness that what you might be used to could be completely foreign to somebody else. So always go in with, I mean, everybody loves when everyone's nice to each other. And I know it probably sounds a bit cliche saying that, but having that awareness of just being genuinely kind to other people and in that space, it will only ever bring out the best of everyone because of there's nothing better than stepping into a set or a rehearsal room and for speaking to everyone you just feel the vibe is a safe area and you can all speak to each other without any fear of judgment or prejudice or anything like that so be open-minded in the way you speak to people um then another one ah. um i would say active listening listen to the people around you in the space. Everybody has their own story to tell. And when you truly listen to what someone's saying, even the nonverbal communication, not everything is, is said through words, but when you truly listen to someone, you pick up so much more. And with that, again, it just enhances the collaborative process and you hear everybody's voice and what everybody wants to say. So yeah, those are my two do's. <laughs> Uh, let's go to Jay next. Oh Lord. Um, the, I suppose being, like you're saying, but being very, being aware and being not afraid to speak up. Um, and that, that will come if you feel safe. So it's, it's uh, so they all roll into one in a sense, but don't be afraid. I think it it, it follows even in in terms of just practical. Never be afraid to ask a question, but never be afraid to speak up if you if you feel in any way something has happened. Because again, by by communicating and talking, we can work through things. But if we don't say it we things can get misconstrued and uh, you know it, it's important to have that so again it's setting up a structure for you know so from the outset you have to set up that safe space uh, for people to feel that but but it you know if you're unfortunate that it isn't there do even go outside of the space and find someone and, and seek help you know don't carry on if you're feeling in any way threatened or intimidated just make sure you speak up because mm -hmm. um that's something i think for me has come through over the years uh having 30 years experience in this business through distribution and uh production is i have seen times when people were just very afraid to say anything and i myself might have been afraid and i'm just so I just love working with young, I mean, 
now I work with the team, Jesse Fisk and uh, Natalie Biancari. We've just made Wolf and they're younger filmmakers and the energy I get from younger filmmakers is fantastic. And that um, just absolute awareness that they can do anything, be anything. And all, all those people I can't see out there, I, you know, I would just, uh, you know, encourage that is not to be afraid. Um, and, uh, you know, so that would be a big, a big do. Yeah. Yeah. I was to find two. There, there's there <laughs> two in there. There was two in there. Go on. Go yeah. On. It was like, do, do, do say it and do be. And don't be afraid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I think um, to add to Jane's point, which is really important, how you say things ultimately dictates how people behave around you. So when you say, um, when, when you're talking about something that's affecting you or talking about something that you've acknowledged from set, I think you should also say that with kindness and try and say that as like as measured as possible. Um, this is something I learned the hard way because I'm very, I'm naturally very critical, but I can also be, because I'm neurodiverse, I can also be really blunt when I'm really critical and it never goes well it absolutely never goes well so just think about how you're consciously saying things as well I'm going to go to Michelle next oh that's such a hard job to go last on this one isn't it I'm gonna okay so do be self-aware as Rico <laughs> just just really perfectly um do be self-aware um that's really really important and surprisingly um difficult actually um I would say um do do remember it's the law <laughs> um it's a oh god it's so boring I'm so boring but um it is the law um that we that we uh look after people um equality act 2010 health and safety at work act 1974 um the, you know well-being looking after people's psychological well-being it's absolutely enshrined in these in within these acts um I, you know i i would maybe say that do do remember that diversity and inclusion are somewhat different as well you know diversity it's whilst it's not a simple thing, but you you can achieve diversity with a recruitment policy. Okay, inclusion is a very very different thing because inclusion is human behaviour and human dynamics. So it's not it's not really enough to just have a, a sort of diversity policy and to bring somebody onto your shoot without actually considering the human dynamics. The that is the inclusion part of it, and that is. That's a more complicated thing, and that sort of I think dovetails in really with what Joshua was saying, because then you've really got to pay attention to things like, um, you know, the voices in the room, the the space, the dynamics, the dynamics of the space, and what is happening. So I think maybe yeah. there were three there. I don't know where he goes. I, I was sweating a lot. I felt like I was under a lot of pressure. But three, three really great examples. And I think it's like, it's really important that you talk about law underpinning mental health and law underpins um, protected characteristics generally as well. So when you are speaking about these things, know that you're protected by law. You're not just um, making, well, in some instances you will be making yourself vulnerable, but you are protected by law. And so that should make you feel less vulnerable because you know, you have a you have a case if anything ever goes wrong. <laughs> so um, so yeah, always be consciously aware of that. But yeah, three really great points from you, Michelle. Um, my two don'ts is don't, and this is probably one of the most common forms of bad behaviour I see on sets. Don't treat your above the line uh, crew different from your below the line crew. In fact, try not to treat anyone on your set different from anyone else because everyone has an equal role on what you're trying to produce. And so everyone has equal value on what you're trying to do. Um, and then my other don't is, um, it kind of leads me to something that is um, very prominent in the disabled community. And they say nothing about us without us. Um, and I think that's really important. Do not create a film with no one represented from that perspective in that film. Um, it's one of the biggest things historically that has led itself to the industry and terrible depictions of ethnically diverse people that feed into stereotypes which are harmful to society. Because you have to think like the most beautiful and also the most detrimental thing about the film industry and film generally is that it's one of the most accessible forms of media. It shows us 
a variety of different perspectives. It feeds into the way that we view people from different communities. So it can either be used as a tool for equality and equity, or it can be used as a tool to separate us and a divisive tool. And I think historically, because the right voices haven't been in the room for the right things it's been used as a tool to be divisive it's fed into stereotypes so I would say yeah nothing about us without us so those are my two uh I'm gonna go Jane Michelle and then Josh <laughs> so Jane your two don'ts um Let me see. You don't like you say, it, it, you know, don't follow kind of trends and and styles and things, but be be truthful and truth and integrity always shine through above all else. Um, and uh, I, I think that's very very important all the way through from whether it's on set or in your script it's it just uh it you can you can just feel it so it is it's 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 echoing more of what you're saying but i actually had written it down when i was reading your list it was it's important it's very important to be true to your own voice and um, not just look around at what others are doing but but it will you know you will get there um and because there's a lot of younger people may be watching and starting out emerging people trying to get started really do believe in yourself um i think that's crucial um and another would be um it's probably slightly but don't don't take things criticism personally necessarily or notes or, or things like that this is more in, in terms of script because people it, to, to grow as a filmmaker you have to be unfortunately able to take rejection and there are good ways of giving a no to somebody and um, because I think it's 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 helpful there's notes are always helpful so try and and take notes uh as as they come um and use them to your benefit so try not take things too personally um because sometimes we can and because filmmaking, particularly for writers and directors, is a very personal uh, experience, you're you're you you know you're really putting yourself out there. Um, so also how we give criticism is equally important. But I think you know it does help us grow if we learn how to give it and learn how to take it. I think that last point I really resonated with, um, and I think that's pretty obvious in my face because I was like, yes, yeah. <laughs> Um, I definitely feel like failure has taught me so much and I would say failure because like all the times that I've done things that could be criticized I, I class in my head as failure but I've learned so much more from failure than I have from success because if you're successful in something everyone's just telling you well done and no one wants to give you criticism and so th therefore you never learn anything but when you're told that you've done something incorrectly you know never to make that that mistake again and so you ultimately grow and you build and you become a better version of yourself so yeah criticism is like so important in this whole industry but also in life like if this relates to like your interpersonal relationships as well which I think is relevant to what we're talking about behaviors on set when like a friend tells you oh, I didn't I didn't like it when you did this it's like oh right I didn't know that's how you felt um and so now I'll make sure that I don't do that because I don't want to make you unhappy it's like as simple as that but like in a professional setting <laughs> those interpersonal relationships are really important um so yeah just wanted to pop in there and say that uh let's go to Michelle next oh thank you okay <laughs> really... oh, sorry Joshua um yeah don't um well I, I do just want to reflect very quickly what the, that point there as well we get like growth mindset is you know it's it, it is the absolute lifeblood of creativity and and innovation never never ever be scared of adopting a growth mindset it's absolutely essential um my i guess my first don't because this is just like a real pet peeve for me would be you know don't dominate the conversation <laughs> if you're around a table if you're in a room and your voice is, you can hear that your voice is the dominant voice, something is going awry. Um, 
Joshua talked about active listening, and I really would recommend that everybody learn a little bit about, about active listening, um, an amazing leadership tool. Um, so, so don't dominate the conversation because you will shut other people down. They will think it's not important for them to speak and for them to contribute. And then you're immediately, you're not in optimal performance. You're kind of in what we would call more survival performance, right? People are just showing up a bit disengaged. What I think doesn't really matter. So that's not, that's not what we want for a, for a highly creative environment. Um, and I, it's just another one. I see this behavior all the time and I, it's, it's like, you know, don't shame people. Um, it's, often it's, it's just being done in a way that's a little bit careless as opposed to being deeply malicious or anything like that. But that is something that, you know, I would say you just pay a lot, a lot of attention to, um, making sure that nobody ever feels kind of shamed um, on, on your film set because it's that is the, the quickest way to shut down a psychologically safe environment. Yeah, I, I, I also resonate with that one. I think that like um, banter or negging on set because there's like, because these are people that you might not, might not necessarily know and have personal connections with. It's not understood that that's your way of, of articulating humor and instantly it puts like, I've experienced it so many times on set and it instantly makes me feel like, I don't, I don't know you well enough for you to say that to me. And it shuts me down completely. And so I'm not engaging in the creative process and you have to think about it like this. Everyone on your set has, a, has something to give, um, whether that's creative or an idea or a, a change in, and filmmaking is fundamentally a collaborative process. You cannot make a film on your own. You cannot make a, a good a good film on your own, I don't think. Um, and if you are making films on your own and they are great, then you are extreme talent. But I think film personally for me is a, is a collaborative process. And so if you aren't allowing people to come together in communication, people to be on equal footing with each other, then you're essentially dooming your film to be less than it could be. Love that. So Josh. You were. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I've had some time to think, luckily. Thank you, guys. <laughs> um, and just building on what everyone be saying, um, it's so lovely. Don't assume. Don't assume things about people. Don't assume if you're, if something's unclear to you or what someone's meant. I would say always ask. Um, that specificity is important because of situations where one person thought, oh, I thought you meant this. I thought you meant you were okay with this. You were okay with this yesterday. So that means you must be okay with it today. It does not mean that. So please always ask, never assume you know how someone is feeling or what somebody else wants. Ask them if you're confused, always please just ask. And then my second no, I would say have an open hand to things instead of a closed hand. And what I mean by that is, of course, let's say, I don't know, you're the writer of the short film. And of course it's your, it's, you made it, you have a very close attachment to it. But at the same time, when you have an open hand, instead of a closed hand, you let other people's views, opinions come into that process. And it's a collaboration. Just as you said, Rico, no one person can make a short film on their own. We're all cogs working together to create the best piece of art that we can. Because at the end of the day, we all want it to be something great. No one's sitting in the corner saying, oh, I hope this is rubbish. You're working on it, you want it to be great. And with that, having an open hand and allowing everyone in the process to be heard, voice their opinions, and whether or not you take or you don't take it, that's up to the person in question, but allowing it to come to you and not shutting it down immediately, taking it in and being like, okay, always have an open hand. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. <laughs> and so we've got four minutes until I open up for questions. So instead of doing reflections, I am going to give three scenarios and I want us all to uh, collaboratively in the room suggest something that could make it better, more inclusive. Um, and so the first uh, scenario I'm going to give is I want to create a film about um, a queer disabled person who falls in love however I am able-bodied uh, I, and I am queer what do I do in that situation to make sure that I'm being inclusive um I, may I Rico 
Absolutely. Um, and I, I think the first thing that you would do is make sure that you, uh, you know, have a disabled person on your on your writing team. Um, that would be my absolute number one. And like you said, we go from the start, not bringing somebody in <laughs> a week before the shoot or but absolutely from the get go from the beginning. Um, you yeah, you would w definitely want to make sure you were doing that. A thousand percent, yeah. I, I think that like it's so important that as soon as you have that kind of like um, idea, you should one be self-critical and say to yourself like, why is this an important story for me? Yeah. Uh, because why why are you invested in a in a love story between someone that's a disabled person um, who's queer? And if that reflects your personal experience in some way, it doesn't have to expect like um, completely. Um, reflect your experience you could have a disabled person as a sibling or you could be friends with a disabled person and their story resonated with you but you should still bring an authentic voice in and you should bring an authentic voice as soon as that seed germinates in your head as soon as that idea is like oh then you should you should bring someone in i'm gonna uh, yeah josh you are yeah just, sorry just building on to that like absolutely do your research immediately bring in the necessary community so you have that authentic voice don't assume that you know what life is like um, for whatever community or you're um, referencing. Make sure you bring them on, have that inclusivity and that's what you need. And I, I might add, I, that's absolutely key for your research for the start, for your script. I would also add that across all your departments, you make sure that everything functions for your entire cast and crew that they have uh, accessibility and that all of that all the way through to when you screen that film because I have seen that in the past where you know it has to be from your art department all the way through so that we are really thinking the whole way down the line and um, so that you know and right to when you go to screen your final film that everybody also can be included and and you know gain access to that cinema. That's great. I've got, I've got one minute, so I'm going to throw out one more scenario. So you've got a crew of five people and a cast of four people. About three hours into your first day of production, communication starts to break down. What can I do to get things back on track with consci being consciously inclusive? I would say the, the, the first thing you should, should do is take time from production to deal with it <laughs> yeah yeah Just don't try and sort it out by going to individual people while production is still rolling take a break say like okay we're gonna have an hour just to get everyone back on track and bring everyone together and have that conversation with everyone in the room so everyone feels like they have an equal part in that conversation I completely agree with that, Rico. Just that's a transparent uh, communication moment. If we were to look at that through the filter of psychological safety and everybody, everybody in the room together, absolutely. Yeah. Which is probably more doable on a on a smaller your description of four and five and less easy to to deal with on a larger scale, but still dealable with because you you have to stop find out and, and work through the departments and get to the core of what the issue is and resolve it. Um, so, yeah. Great, it's been lovely to chat to you guys. We're gonna move on to the Q&A section of the evening. So I'm just gonna check my list. The first question we've got is from uh, Gabrielle and uh, they ask, what was the process you went through to get your own films funded? Um, I will go first because mine is super simple. Uh, I I applied for funding both of the times that I've done short films. I applied for funding through BFI Network. Um, the process is is super simple. I, I wouldn't say it's an easy process, but it is super simple. You need a budget. You need a producer. You need a good script, um, and you need to fill in the application form. Um, they, I would also pay attention to the diversity standards in the vein of this conversation because uh, the diversity standards we have at BFI dictate that you have to have um, inclusion and diversity embedded in, in, your, in your filmmaking process. So there are several different sections. Um, there's A, B, C, and D. 
you have to have at least three things from each of those sections, I think, apart from uh, D, because D is mostly for a, a different different fund. Um, and those are things like, um, is are the people um, that you're hiring coming in at a different step from the from the step that previously worked on as a film? So are you giving opportunity? Or things like, are you making sure that your film is representative or diverse or inclusive? Um, so yeah, I got mine through BFI Network. Um, and if you want to get your short film funded through BFI Network, you can get in touch with us as the BFI. Um, Cara and James head up um, the BFI Network internally, or you can reach out to Film London if you're based in London. If not, if you're not based in London, uh, then the your local film hub um, will have access to a network talent exec who can talk you through the process. Jane, do you want to? I'm in here. Um, yeah, well, getting a short film made is, you know, a triumph for anyone. Um, and a lot of people will end up doing them with favors and they might be at an earlier stage where they can't, you know, I, I, you know, it is hard even to get that, that step up to get the real funding, you know, and I know I'm based in Ireland and sometimes Italy and I know here even trying to get your short film made you already have to have made a short and god love people i'm going well how can they have made a short if you know it's like <laughs> so it, it can be quite tricky um so there are regional there there are other ways and this kind of can be regional seed money and uh script labs and different ways you can kind of wheedle your way in and get enough and then try and get it depends if it's your first um short uh, I suppose I would say to everyone, just try and, you know, believe in yourself and you will you will get it, whether you've got it with uh, funding and support, which is brilliant that they are out there for, for short filmmakers. But if you have a great idea and, um, you know, go for it and and use use it as much as we were saying, you know, even use those templates from BFI about how you how you work and use your prep. But you know, just to encourage you, um, go for it. If you don't get it the first time, go for it again. And, uh, you know, even make a little scene, you know, just just keep keep working at it. So I, I've dealt mainly with feature films, which is 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 um, uh, the same, actually. You know, you're having to get your script and go for it and get your 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 production funding from BFI, Screen Ireland, Polish Film Institute, Euromage, whatever on a different scale it's up one but you know if it's actually all filmmaking at the end of the day and 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 all the same rules apply so um i'm going to i'm going to pop onto the next question um which is what is your take on telling stories or dealing with sensitive situations on screen that the filmmaker not might not have been directly affected by but wants to do explore and do justice um, I guess from my perspective, um, it's fine if you want to do a film uh, that you, uh, that has uh, a topic or narrative that you're not personally affected by. But I would question why you want to be why you want to lead that film. I think that for two reasons, because like people from protected characteristics or people that aren't have been underrepresented and under resourced don't have the same opportunities as, as communities that have been resourced properly. And a lot of the time, what people from marginalized communities will have is their own story or the story that directly affects them. And that will often win them funding by someone coming in that hasn't got a lived experience of that experience doing that story. A lot of the attitudes to, for funders will be like, we already had a story like this, so we don't need to fund another one. Um, so there's a point of contention there. So I would really question whether or not you're taking an opportunity away from someone that whose experience is reflected in the film. but there are other ways for you to engage in that and and produce those stories. Um, if you want to do them justice, you might not necessarily be the leader of that. You might it might be a process where you go out into the communities that you're trying to reflect and ask if anyone wants to tell a story or engage in this process with you. And it might not be led by you; it might be led by them. But you're still helping bring that story to life. You just aren't the focus of that story, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, sorry for filibustering that one. <laughs> Um, anyone got anything else to add on that question? 
Um, Rico, I think I would just say, you know, if you are a filmmaker who's working around sensitive content, you do need to be really, really careful um, of all the people, all of your cast and all of your crew. Um, don't assume that people are just okay with sensitive or traumatic content. Um, people may well not be okay with it and they might not tell you that, you know, straight off the, off the bat. Um, people might be making an assumption that they need to be okay with it. But you might be dealing with things that are really triggering for people. Uh, you would probably want to think about things like mental health risk assessments beforehand. Um, so um, if you don't know anything about mental health risk assessment, maybe just do a quick Google, have a look at it online. But that's a really good way of just stopping for a minute and thinking about what is the, what is the content, what are the sensitivities, who is it that you're working with and, and trying to take in some of the different dynamics that can come up around trauma and triggers for people. But you, you definitely want to take some time to think about that up front. I think that that answered one of the questions that we had from James. Um, do you have any advice supporting um, crew and cast on set that might have personal experience or sensitive situations that are being explored on set? Um, I think that was a really great succinct answer. Um, I'm going to answer Anna's question at the bottom uh, just because it's it, it's a super quick and simple answer. So above the line um, crew would be your writer, director, producer um, and your DOP in certain occasions and everyone else is below the line. So above the line crew are people that are decision makers on your well, who are traditionally um, decision makers on your on your um, production, whereas everyone else is below the line. Uh, next question is, um, when you bring someone on board for a short film, when a character you're writing has a different background to you, how would you credit that person? Would they be a co-writer, an advisor, or something else? Does anyone else want to answer this question? Consultants, you, you can bring them on a different, you, you'll agree with the person. Again, it's, it's about inclusivity, collaboration. So you will negotiate their credit. So it depends on what they are actually providing you with. If it's just advice, they might be a consultant. If they're writing it with you, then they might get the co-writing or, you know, written by Rico and Jane. But if, it, you know, so it's talk to, you, you, you'll work out, you know, it's important to work out uh, that in advance, actually. Very important to work out the credit in advance and not after. So that there's no miscommunication again there. But you said I was a writer. So you you are very, be very clear. I mean, there is, you know, clarity around uh, what job descriptions are is also something that can help, you know. So people know exactly what's expected of them. And, you know, the, and that, that helps too. I would also say, like, just be really uh, conscious about how you're having that conversation, because I know that if, if you're coming in as a director or, or, or lead writer and you're having that conversation with one of your consultants who also wants to be credited as a co-writer because they are writing it with you, don't come from a place of authority because actually you're equals in that conversation and that will really help make them feel like they're being listened to and nurtured because they should be listened to and nurtured in that situation. If OK, I've got a question from Diana. If someone came to me on my set and shared that they were uncomfortable or there was an incident on set, how would I go about dealing with this professionally? I think this is probably one for Michelle. Yes, I would say maybe me or Joshua. I, get, I think depending on what the, you know, where the, the context of the discomfort. So I think that, you know, the first thing to do is active listening you would want to really listen to that person and understand what the what the discomfort was to do with it, you know whether that's to do with something that's that's actually being um shot or whether it might be something that's around an interpersonal relationship um so i think that's the first thing discern what the actual what the actual challenge is there um and then what was the rest of the question rico what would you do what would you do yeah, what, what what would you do? Yeah. Joshua, I'm kind of interested in like what how you would approach that if if it was something to do if somebody was uncomfortable with somebody, you know, something that was being shot, say. Yeah, absolutely. Um of course like each situation is different and it really depends on what the nature of this particular 
thing is but if let's say an actor was uncomfortable with something that was going to be in the scene um or even if on the day that's when they're like oh I'm uncomfortable doing this I would speak with them and if they convey with me saying I'm uncomfortable doing this I would then convey that to the director and producer there on set saying hey they're not comfortable doing this they've offered perhaps this alternative can we go with that um really just like in that particular scenario it's important for people to remember and realize that they don't have to do anything they don't want to do and of course like directors out there will threaten people saying well you'll be off the job or whatever but you don't have to do anything even if you're in a contract if you do not feel comfortable doing something you do not have to do it never feel pressured to do anything that you don't want to do so in that situation i'll convey that with the director um producer and we'll go from there we'll find an alternative that caters for how the actor feels because we want them to be feel safe and comfortable um in terms of an instance where it's something else that may not be related to the scene, but something that may have happened with um, a, a, a co-scene partner or someone else on set, then I guess each production has its own ways of dealing with different types of issues. But in sense of when it's intimacy, then of course, as the intimacy coordinator, that's when I stick my foot into things and <laughs> do what I can. <laughs> I would say as well, yeah. that's why it's important to have that um, code of conduct as well um, that Rico talked about. Yeah, we have, a, you, you would have a protocol in production, which is like a, a human resources, but you know, so that you can actually really deal with this so people can come to production. Uh, and there is a set of, you know, every production will have a way to try and deal with any conflict or any issues that arise. and. Likewise, Josh, as you say, on with scenes um, uh, of, of any intimacy, I, again, prep is key that your cast have discussed at length uh, with the director exactly what's going to happen and how that scene is going to be shot. And even then, when it comes to be done, as you say, if there's something of the, I, I just, I, it doesn't feel right now, that's fine. So it's, it's, again, it's communication, but preparation really, you know, you, you, you'll make sure that if you're doing any, any scenes that make people feel uncomfortable or put them in any situation that is <clears throat> something that they have to, you know, is challenging for them. You, you mustn't, you, you can't, you, you never just spring anything. So no matter if you're doing a short or whatever you're doing, you must, must, must prepare anyone for any scene that is any way challenging to them never assume you can go oh we'll just try this no you will never do that it's not right it's not you know so you that's really important to make sure that those scenes are talked through yeah we we have unfortunately reached the end of our time i did notice that there were three questions about uh, intimacy coordination and that is if there was a database of intimacy coordination how someone gets into intimacy coordination and also, um, oh, what was the other one? Sorry, uh, what are the day-to-day -day tasks of an intimacy coordinator on set? Um, but yeah, if you wanna do those really quickly and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Sorry, Fiona. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just quickly in terms of if you're interested in intimacy coordination, then I would say, Intimacy for Stage and Screen it's a website, check it out. Also check their Instagram and they have workshops if you want an introduction to intimacy coordination as well as different particular jobs or what you may encounter as an intimacy coordinator. Um, sorry, what was the other question? <laughs> and there's one about whether or not there's a database for intimacy, co intimacy coordination um, and what's the, what is, uh, like what is the role of intimacy coordination, I guess? Um, so on a day-to-day -day basis, or let's just say prior to being on set, um, I would have spoken with production, the director, understood their vision for the scene. Then I'll speak to the actors individually, speaking about consent, boundaries, what they're comfortable with and not comfortable with. And then with that, based on what's in the scene, we'll go through and have complete clarity of what's expected, what is the context of the scene and what they are okay with and what they are not okay with. 
then we'll have a discussion with the director as well saying like okay this is what they're comfortable with they've offered that they're comfortable to, to do this or if they're just happy with the scene in general then we'll go ahead with the scene we'll have a rehearsal then of course speaking to them before the day that we film on the day we film we'll have if it is a a scene that requires a close set we'll have a close set we'll have a rehearsal um first ad will make sure that everybody prior to being on set understands what is part of the close set protocols and i guess the protocol that should be adhered to on the day and then shoot the scene um i like to have a closure exercise with the actors um afterwards especially depending on what the scene was about um i'll have a closure exercise with them so that after the day they can feel like okay i'm stepping out of my professional into my personal life now and i can leave set without anything that is lingering hopefully yeah yeah <laughs> really, uh, with, with the stuff of like a day day-to-day uh, uh, intimacy coordinator the only thing i would add, add with that is um is definitely be conscious about the content of your script and your intimacy coordinator if you're dealing with like uh like things that need require intimacy coordinator that deal with um I don't know, like black, blackness and queerness, try and get an intimacy coordinator that reflects that experience because it will make it a lot Absolutely. easier for, your, uh, for, for the person that's doing that work. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think this has been a really exciting and engaging conversation. Uh, one of like the easiest conversations I've had about inclusion in, in a while. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining me today. And I'm gonna hand back to Fiona. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rico. Uh, thanks, Joshua, Jane and Michelle. That was a fantastic discussion. Really insightful. So thanks to all of you. And thanks to participants for all the questions. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get through all of them, but we did a pretty good job. So thanks, Rico. Um, <laughs> just a quick reminder that uh, our BFI, the Film Academy Labs, are currently hybrid. So we're running um, an event on a Monday night, which you've just been to, and then a, another event on the following Saturday. And that Saturday event's in person. Um, this weekend, we're running one at uh, 12.30pm at BFI Southbank. That's all about um, sustainable filmmaking. So there'll be a panel discussion about the best way to uh, make your film sustainably, uh, a screening and then networking drinks afterwards. Um, tickets are six pounds. And I think Zakia is gonna, she's already popped it in the chat. So um, yeah, come along to that. We'll, we'll look forward to seeing you in person, having a free networking drink. And we'll also have our um, script doctors on hand if you need advice on script writing or the sort of general, anything really, they're, they're, they're great. Um, one last thing is that we are asking attendees to fill in a survey. So our surveys really help um, help us improve our events and make sure that we're giving you the kind of events that are useful to you. So Akia is sharing that link now. If you could just please take a couple of minutes to fill up that survey, that would really help us. Um, I'll also send it around by email tomorrow if you'd rather do it then. So yeah, thank you so much for attending. Um, as I said at the, at the top, um, we will be posting this recording on YouTube. So if you've missed anything or you want to see it again, um, watch our socials, we'll, we'll announce when it's posted up there. So yeah, thanks again to all our panelists, Rico, and uh, have a great evening, anyone, everyone, and hopefully we'll see you on Saturday.